Welcome to the Afghanistan Project Podcast. I'm your host, Beth Bailey, and today I'm excited to welcome Sean Carberry, a journalist and author with extensive experience covering events in Afghanistan. Sean has visited Afghanistan multiple times, including while he served as the last Kabul-based correspondent for NPR between 2012 and 2014. He also spent four years working on the DOD Inspector General's Operations Freedom Sentinel uh, alongside other DOD reporting. He's the author of Passport Stamps, Searching the World for a War to Call Home, which is a memoir about his time as a war correspondent in many different fields in which we were involved in that global war on terror, from my understanding. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Certainly uh, a lot of those spaces, Arab Spring and, and others. Yep. My goodness. Yeah, that sounds like a really incredible book, and I really want to get my hands on it. It's so great to have you here today. Thanks for being here to talk about all of, we have a lot of really important <laughs> to cover here, so I'm really excited to get started and talk about the yeah, things that you've no, seen. Yeah, really, really happy to be with you, Beth. Yeah, well, let's start with the beginning. You know, 2009, mm -hmm. I think, was your first trip to Afghanistan uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in a, you know, covering the situation capacity. What was that like? What was your preparation like, you know, in your mindset as you went into, this was probably right after we had kind of reconcentrated efforts on Afghanistan um, right before the surge period. So let's place yeah. everybody in where you were and, and what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my first time on the ground was January, 2009. So actually just a few weeks before president Obama was inaugurated. So obviously at that point there was, you know, a lot of campaign focus and discussion about Afghanistan and about how to try to turn things around. So in the lead up to that trip, my my focus of my reporting was looking at the porous border between Pakistan and Afghanistan and how uh, that made it incredibly difficult to deal with the situation, that any insurgency that has external support and external sanctuary and where you know the U.S. NATO mission could go up to this line, but the Taliban could cross it into other territory um, was one of the you know ongoing challenges of of the war in Afghanistan. So I was looking to get out somewhere in the east, close to the Pakistan border, to kind of look at how difficult it was to secure that terrain to cut off uh, those supply lines and transit routes for for the Taliban. And uh, ended up just because of the the timing of when I was able to go and what embeds were available, I ended up going to Logman province, which even though it wasn't a border province, it had a lot of routes through it that were, you know, transit lines Taliban used to get to, to Pakistan. And there were certain areas where, you know, there was a U.S. troop presence. And then beyond that, it was really just, you know, rugged, ungoverned terrain. So I was trying to, to get out and, and see that. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I finally got got to Bagram, spent a couple of days there trying to get flights out to uh, to uh, Nangahar, um and then get up to uh, to, to Logman. Eventually got to uh, Medarlam, uh, one of the medium-sized bases there. Uh, spent a couple days there, and then finally got out with some uh, civil affairs and provincial reconstruction team uh, operations missions. Really, just going out to look at some of the work they were doing to build roads, to try to do development, a lot of that side of, of counterinsurgency. And so that was really my first time out on the ground in remote parts of Afghanistan. Cause you know, once we got off the base and drove for, you know, half an hour and got off paved roads, I mean, you were really in a, a different world. And that was one of the most immediately striking things to me is just how different it was, how undeveloped it was, uh, you know, villages was still with no electricity, uh, sort of these, you know, the images of the crumbling mud houses, uh, some with windows, some without, and just, you know, the incredibly poor undeveloped conditions that people were living in. And that was so immediately striking to me thinking about this grand vision of transitioning Afghanistan into a modern democracy with, you know, all the trappings of, of equality and elections and, and all these things and thinking about, okay, that's this great 
30,000 foot ideal, but on the ground here, uh, you know, you have people who are, are just scratching out a living and the last thing on their mind is what kind of ballot system they're going to use in elections or things like that. Um, so, you know, that was sort of my first taste of really seeing the, the gap between kind of the aspiration and the reality on the ground. And so that, that's, you know, stayed with me, you know, the entire time I, I dealt with Afghanistan. And then on that embed, I went up to a smaller base, a little farther north into an area where it was kind of the last base beyond which was, you know, just terrain that, that U.S. forces really didn't have much visibility on. And so we did a couple of patrols around the, the village near the base. And one of the soldiers was talking to me at one point, explaining how there was a, a lot of double dipping in the village. And what he meant by that was there were a lot of locals who by day were very welcoming of, of U.S. And, and NATO forces and supportive of the mission and would take assistance and would work on projects and things like that. But by night, uh, you know, Taliban would come through the area and threaten people and pay them to uh, either plant IEDs or to shoot at, at U.S. forces. And so, again, that was another really striking dynamic that I saw in, in my first trip was this notion that, you know, the people were a lot of them, again, trying to make a living and they would support whoever seem to be most capable of delivering something for them, peace, stability, economic opportunity. And so, uh, you know, th yeah, they would go back and forth and they would, you know, not necessarily nefariously play sides off each other, but they're looking for kind of maximum benefit. And if one side looked to be stronger at a given time, they'd lean in that direction because they, you know, they didn't want to be on the losing side of whoever was really going to be in power in their area. And so over the rest of my time in Afghanistan, I saw those dynamics play out where people, uh, you know, in theory, they would say, yes, I support the, the government, the Karzai government. I support, you know, freedom, democracy, all these things. But at the end of the day, they're trying to survive, feed their families. And if they see the Taliban is stronger in their area, well, then, you know, they're going to lean in that direction. Uh, and, and that was just one of the things that was um, just sort of constantly in flux once you got outside of the major population centers. And I think why it was so hard for a lot of people to really understand because so many people were operating in the population centers, you know, State Department, USAID, a lot of the, you know, international organizations, they might have people out in the provinces, but still so much interaction was happening in Kabul, which was, you know, just a bubble really on, on many levels. And so uh, from, you know, the get-go, um, I was seeing things on the ground that, you know, immediately questioned the, the entire enterprise and the feasibility of, of what the international community was hoping for in the country. Sure. And yeah, you're speaking to all of the things that I remember at that time, you know, before we started recording, I was telling you this 2009 is when I was starting to learn about Afghanistan and learning all mm -hmm. of these things like the PRT system, which I don't think anyone on the podcast has yet talked about the PRT system. So I'm going to ask you about that sure. in a few minutes, because mm -hmm. it's something that to me, it always seemed so aspirational and fantastic. Mm -hmm. Look, you're getting on the ground, you're building wells. But then I remember also thinking, well, hey, you know, you're building, let's say you're building a school. If you're building it out of plywood and it's not, you know, something that's going to be sustainable and something that's going to last through time, or it's not something people can afford to keep up on their own, you know, are these things that we're doing that are not going to last? And as I was reading, you wrote this excellent, not to totally tease <laughs> the future here, you wrote an awesome opinion piece in the Hill. Um, and when I read what you wrote, I was like, oh, it just hit me right in the heart um, that we had been, I liken the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan to building a house by constructing an elaborate second floor and propping it up on rickety stilts stuck into mud. And it was just so apt. That is to, the best way that I've heard <laughs> it put. And this is, that's kind of what you're describing here is mm -hmm. this 
you know, oh, well, and we know what we're doing in the Capitol and we have all these grand plans about what we're doing. But once again, and I've brought this up before in the podcast too, you know, we would go out and do surveys of the population. Mm -hmm. Do you support the Afghan government? And what would they tell us? Yeah, absolutely. We sure, sure. The yeah. Government. Well, the Taliban did those surveys too. And what right. would they tell the Taliban? We support you because you don't want to die. You don't yeah. want to pick the wrong horse and end up not able to work, not able to, you know, it, on the Taliban's bad side or on the government's bad side, because mm -hmm. um, Michael DeSirio was on last week talking about his first night in Afghanistan, hearing the Afghan police just torturing someone yeah. inside their facility. And there was nothing they could do about it, you know, and it's it, no one is perfect here. This is a very mm -hmm. difficult, complicated zone and people had to make choices every day in this very complex war zone. So I'd love to hear, that's my little aside, but I'd love to mm -hmm. hear about the PRT. What was the PRT doing when you were visiting that area? And do you think it was really, you know, was there real buy-in? Was there um, just that kind of like, yeah, we we're glad to have this, but at night, you know, there's still that double dipping kind of thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, the PRT concept, you know, made sense on a lot of levels, right? I mean, it was these sort of teams of uh, military state and, and aid sort of working together to do uh, generally smaller scale things in communities. Again, that whole, the, the counterinsurgency aspect of that, that build aspect of, you know, building clinics, schools, things like that, building roads, things that all seem to, to make a lot of sense. Um, and we're designed to then get the community to have more economic opportunity. The, the thing that, that was always the challenge with PRTs was they were U S led in some case, there were actually some international led uh, PRTs around Afghanistan, but it's the same concept. It was still external doing these projects to the extent possible in coordination with Afghan leaders and elders and things like that. But the hope was that that would create Afghan appreciation for the Afghan government, right? I mean, the goal was to create this linkage and this buy-in and support for the Afghan government, and therefore the population would support the government over the Taliban. And that linkage rarely happened from, from what I saw that the locals saw the PRTs as, you know, the U.S., basically. And the PRTs might come in and do good things in a community, and the community would support the PRTs and the, you know, the U.S. or international personnel involved. But they wouldn't necessarily then make the leap of saying, this is President Karzai, and this is the Afghan government, and, you know, we can support this government that is supporting us. Uh, and the local people would, they wouldn't go to the, you know, the district governor for things. They would go to the PRT or the, the U S military. And so there was kind of this, you know, dependency that was being created. And I would hear a lot of times that, um, when I was out with PRTs meeting with Afghans and they would say, Hey, you know, you're delivering for us, you're building something here. Uh, but, the, you know, the Afghan government's not supporting it. The district governor isn't getting, doing his part to get teachers to, you know, support the school, support the clinic, things like that. So that was, you know, the big challenge. And, you know, the sort of dynamic that also went on is, and I saw it in, in Iraq as well with a lot of the, the, the building efforts there, is trying to make that handoff and building the Afghan capacity to do these things, to take it over. That's that analogy of that, that second floor and, and the stilts that, yeah, you could go in and build a school, but how long would it take to build the Afghan capacity to have the teachers, to have the administration, to, to run the school, to run it effectively, to sustain it. And that is, you know, generational change that that needs to happen so you can go in and and build these things and put in a road um but building the capacity to to take over these projects to to run them um and and also to, to even decide is is this the right 
fit for, for this community, you know, is a school the most important thing? Um, and, you know, there were cases where PRTs would work with communities. They'd come in and say, okay, we have a menu of, you know, five different things we can do for you. Like we can pave a road, we can build this, or we can build that. We, you know, what do you want? What would be most useful? So, so there were cases where they would try to get buy-in. Um, but just a, a lot of the time, the things were, were being done um, to try to create impact, to try to show change, uh, to try to get the local population to say, oh, hey, things are getting better. We should support the Afghan government. Um, you know, that that was just a, a really difficult thing to, to make that jump. And, you know, I saw my second trip to Afghanistan was later in 2009 uh, when the surge was happening. And I spent some time with a variant of the PRT, which was the agribusiness development team. So these were National Guard units from the U.S. from farming states that went over to try to do agriculture focused projects. And it, that was actually a really fascinating trip in, in embed because some of the National Guard people were really invested in figuring out local solutions that fit the conditions on the ground as opposed to here's how Americans would do things. We're going to do this. And then you're going to start to do things that way. Uh, they would look at, okay, what do they have available? What do they have for goat feed? How can we take the ingredients they have to feed their goats and shift the balance a little bit? So it's more nutritious. Uh, how do we teach them to give warming medicine to their goats? Because they see within weeks of that, the goats are bigger they're healthier and they can sell them for more money, you know? So they were looking for these really sort of micro things. And I thought, okay, this actually does make sense because these are incremental changes that people can see quick results from. And so some of that approach kind of made sense. And on the same trip, I went to visit this giant USAID project in Kabul. And it was this farm that they had taken over and, and were setting up all these modern agricultural techniques and stuff that I was looking at going, this is great, but this is really expensive. It's really complicated. And they said, well, what's going to happen is we bring in village elders from around the country, show them this farm. They're then going to go back to their villages and say, you should do this grape trellising approach, or you should do tented strawberry gardens or all these things. And I'm thinking, yeah, this, this, this isn't going to work. This is a lot of money. It was run by a, a guy from Guatemala who was brought in because there were similar agricultural conditions, but none of it to me seemed at all scoped toward what could be absorbed by Afghan people in villages. Um, Where are they going to get the materials is what immediately comes to me, right? They can't go yep. to a tractor supply company and go get <laughs> A strawberry tent, right? So this, it's, yeah. that's a big problem. And it's something that is identified by so many people who come on here and talk about their time in Afghanistan. And it's like, well, we couldn't get supplies here unless we airlifted them. So it's like, we just didn't think about those very basic things. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. I didn't mm. mean to interrupt you. I, this no, no. is fascinating to me. Yeah. So, you know, just the the other thing I, I was going to say, so the, the agribusiness development teams, to my eye, were at least getting closer to something where they weren't trying to transform, you know, move Afghanistan centuries ahead. They were looking for little things um, that that they could impart, at, you know, at least the one that I spent time with. Uh, but one of the other things too, though, that, that was striking is that I went out with them at one point on a mission to, uh, again, another very remote village, sort of one road in, one road out type of place. And uh, we spent a couple hours in there because they were inspecting this um, water control project, basically sort of a, a, they called it a check dam, but it was on a hillside. So they're building kind of, it was like a bobsled run type of thing for water. So it controlled the runoff and didn't flood their fields. Uh, and then they spent an hour paying the Afghans who were doing the work. And so I sat watching all this. And as we were about to drive out of the, the village, uh, there was a big explosion nearby. 
And, uh, you know, so they, the security forces went off to see what was going on. They, you know, threw the journalist and some of the other people in, in the, the MRAPs and said, you know, shelter in place kind of thing. And uh, they determined that a motorcyclist riding into the village had hit a tripwire and detonated an IED on the road into the village. And fortunately, the guy was fine because he was to the side of the blast. But the reality of that was that IED wasn't in the road when we drove into the village. It was planted while we were in the village. And so either someone in that village that U.S. forces were paying to do work had made a phone call to alert someone that there was, you know, contingent of U.S. troops in the village plant an IED or someone had been around and watching and saw the convoy go in and, you know, ran, but it was, you know, less than a half a mile away from where the, the mission had parked and had been hanging out for a couple of hours. And so again, just another reminder that you just, you know, you never knew. Um, and you didn't know if at that point you were paying someone who was involved in, in trying to kill you. Um, and, you know, just sort of a constant reminder of, of how difficult it was uh, to, to really make significant change, to, to get that buy-in um, and to deal with the fact that, yeah, people were sitting there going, okay, U.S. is paying me, you know, $50 for two weeks of work, um, but the Taliban is going to pay me $200 to plant this IED. Yeah, that's... That must have been a very frightening moment. Were there a lot of moments like that as a journalist when you were in Afghanistan of being in the vicinity of IEDs going off in the middle of, you know, gunfight? It sounds like you were in areas that so far I haven't heard of any gunfights ongoing mm -hmm. while you were there. But what was did that happen often or was this a, more of a one time? So there were there were a lot of sort of one offs like that. Um, on that same embed when I was at, uh, so I was staying at, uh, Camp Salerno in Host province, uh, during that embed. And I think it was within a day of that, we were sitting at the little bazaar in the, uh, the base that was, uh, you know, run by, by Afghans. And so I was with some soldiers and we're drinking tea with some of the Afghans and you know, having a really nice, interesting conversation about the ele presidential election at the time. And all of a sudden you heard sort of a whoosh sound and a boom and then another really loud boom. And basically two rockets had come in. Uh, one flew over us, hit out on the airfield. The other one struck a tree uh, about 75 to 100 yards from where we were all sitting. Uh, so, you know, we all you know, ran off in, into the bunker until the all clear and then went over to, to look at what happened and the rocket hit a tree and detonated and then sprayed shrapnel all over um, a tent that uh, there were about seven soldiers in the tent working. And I, I you know, when I, I write about it in the book, I'd liken it to sort of the scene in Pulp Fiction where the kid runs out of the bathroom and unloads his gun at, at the characters and misses them and you see the big holes in the wall behind them. And that was like this tent. There were just holes and uh, computer monitors were hit and lamps were hit. And the seven people in the room, of them, only one sustained an injury. He got hit in the leg by a little piece of shrapnel and walked off to get it taken care of. Um, but had that tree not been there, it's entirely possible the rocket would have landed in the tent and, you know, kind of game over at that point. And so there were, you know, lots of moments like that, that it was just a matter of inches and dumb luck. Uh, and yeah, later when I lived in Kabul, you know, two and a half years there, there were frequent bombings and large scale attacks and, um, you know, a number that were, you know, one point I was driving home from an interview and all of a sudden there was a loud boom and I see smoke from a couple of blocks away. And, you know, the typical human response would be, okay, drive as far away as fast as possible. And I go to my driver, okay, go as close as possible because we have to see what's, 
what's going on. And it was a, a Taliban attack on one of the um, Afghan intelligence service uh, compounds in, in Kabul and the typical attack where, you know, they set a suicide bomb to blow a hole in the, the gate entrance area. And then guys went in and shot as many people as they could until they were all killed. Um, so, you know, those kinds of attacks went on, you know, every few months throughout the time that I was in Kabul and, uh, you know, ultimately as, as I, I, you know, write about, there was one attack that was on a, uh, uh, a restaurant that a lot of Westerners went to eat in Kabul. And I had been there the week before and that attack was intentionally targeting Western civilians and, uh, you know, killed some UN workers and other people, people that, that I knew and, you know, was friends with. And I was two blocks away when that happened with a bunch of other journalists. Uh, it was a Friday night. We were just, you know, socializing. We we're actually getting ready. To, we were going to be going to a party at the Russian embassy that was an ABBA themed party. Uh, another example of just the, you know, the, the absurdity that was Kabul. Um, and this, you know, this attack went off and we spent the night covering it and then, you know, found out that, that friends of ours were, were killed in that. So, you know, that was, especially in 2014, there were a lot of attacks targeting the international community. And, and that was another kind of turning point and a signal that, you know, this, this thing isn't working and it's, it's not likely to, to end well. No. And what was, that like for i mean did you ever during these increases in attacks think i need to get out of here or or i don't want to push forward too much because i'm assuming Mm -hmm. from your timeline you know npr you're the last npr correspondent so uh, did they pull you in 2014 and say this is too dangerous for you to remain here or was that partially your your choice that you know this is too hot right now and too pathetic yeah, so actually it was it was neither of those. It was actually it w- it was entirely premeditated. So when when I was sent in 2012, uh NPR said you're going to stay till the end of 2014 and then close the bureau. And because you know another piece of the the timeline here at that point in 2012, that was the agreement that US troops were going to leave at the end of 2014. And so one of the big narratives that I was covering throughout my time there is whether or not the U.S. and Afghanistan were going to sign a new security agreement that would allow U.S. forces to stay after 2014 and continue some type of mission. Uh, so that was that was the the intent and the plan um, that, you know, they were going to shut it down like like, you know, Baghdad. I actually was the producer with NPR and helped shut down the Baghdad Bureau in December of 2011. Um, and so that, that was the plan at the end of 2014 it's done, um, you know, full-time presence is, is out. Uh, obviously the U S and Afghanistan eventually did sign an agreement. It didn't go in effect until September of 2014 when president Ghani eventually emerged from, uh, the theater of the 2014 presidential election in Afghanistan. And he signed the agreement at which point, you know, NPR was long committed to, to closing down and, and there was no way to shift gears and uh, stay. I mean, I, I would have stayed and I actually did propose that saying we should stay at least another six months to see how things play out in this next phase after the end of combat operations and this ongoing, you know, train advise assist thing. But, um, you know, the resources just, just weren't there to do it. So, uh, it was, it was, you know, it was definitely tough to leave then because, you know, the story was by no means done. Um, but yes, it, it, over the course of 2014, it, it changed a lot. It was, uh, it was harder to move around. A lot of international organizations had pulled people out. Some of the restaurants had closed. A lot of the social life for the foreign community had, had constricted. So, uh, it was, it was a definite sea change, but, um, uh, you know, as I say, if if it had been up to me, I, I definitely would have stayed longer. Yeah. And so I feel like we, 
went way forward here. Mm -hmm. I want to take yeah. time to backtrack. Were sure. there any visits that you had between the end of 2009 and then when you came on with NPR? Yeah, so actually, I, I, I didn't get back there. Uh, so from so October 2009, and then my next time on the ground was June of 2012. Um, and I mean, you know, one of the first stories I did when I got to, uh, to NPR or got to Kabul for NPR in, in June of 2012 was kind of a, a big story about how much Kabul had changed, um, how much, <clears throat> excuse me, population had grown traffic. Uh, you know, there, there, there was very little traffic in 2009 when I was there. Um, but the city was just overgrown, swollen, uh, choked with traffic in 2012 when I got there. So, uh, I, you know, I was hoping to get back there, but I ended up in that period spending a little bit more time in Iraq and, uh, and other places. Um, and you know, 20, 2011 spent a lot of that time dealing with the Arab spring in Libya. So there were, you know, lots of competing, uh, uh, unfortunate narratives to deal with in that time. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I can only imagine the things that you saw in that <clears throat> period. And so what did you take, you know, and what was your takeaway from all of that? Seeing how much Kabul had changed, was that a good thing to you? Or was that a sign of more of this elaborate second floor, but you figured that underneath it was still the rickety, you know, whole structure. <sighs> Yeah, to me it was it was not a good sign because it meant people were fleeing other parts of the country and coming into Kabul. And it was a sign of a couple of dynamics. One was that a lot of the money and investment was in Kabul. So there were there were jobs and opportunities and the international community was there. So there was a lot of draw there, um, but there were just a lot of parts of the country that that weren't safe. People didn't feel uh, safe anymore. And so they were going to the major population centers. So that really in and of itself was, was kind of a, a negative indicator. Uh, you know, a lot of people tried to, to turn it into a positive talk, about you know, Kabul is this bustling, you know, city and all that. And yeah, the, you know, there was, there was activity, there was investment. Kabul was safer than, you know, other parts of the country, but, uh, the fact that, you know, I was interviewing a lot of people in Kabul who were saying, yeah, I, I live in Helmand and it's just not safe. And I don't know if and when I can go back. Um, you know, I visited uh, internally displaced persons camps in the Kabul area and everyone, you know, had fled there within the previous year or two from other parts of the country. Uh, so the population growth in, in Kabul, um, you know, there were some positive reasons for that. But it was, again, to me, yeah, that artificial second floor of the house. There was money, there was investment, there were programs, there were opportunities for people to, to come in, uh, get involved in, but that investment wasn't translating back out into, you know, the rest of Afghanistan. It wasn't building capacity. It wasn't making lasting change. Uh, you know, it was just this, um, you know, cycle of opportunity for a lot of people. How devastating. And to think about too, you know, what we, we would find out nine years later when that was the last bastion of, of everything before the Taliban came in and then took that to just, and how easily compared to what people expected, they took those outlying areas where mm -hmm. the people living in Kabul were not feeling safe to live. You know, it's what a, um, did you at the time, you know, you had this in mind that we were going to leave or what were you thinking about how that was going to look given what you were seeing in Kabul? Yeah. So while I, while I was there in that, that 12 to 14 period, um, I mean, there was tremendous uncertainty because, you know, the, the hope was that there would be an ongoing international presence and there'd be a new agreement. Um, but a lot of Afghans were, uh, looking, looking for a way out. So I did a lot of stories about how the, some of the smuggling operations and how much people were paying to be smuggled out of the country and get fake passports and try to get to Turkey and Europe and things like that. And the growth in the number of Afghans who were looking for ways out, 
Um, I did a lot about uh, the, the growth and demand for the, the SIVs at that time. Uh, a lot of people were, were again, trying to get out um, in 2014. I think it was 2014 before the security agreement was signed. I uh, you know, did a story about that dynamic that um, friends of mine who worked for NGOs or contracting companies said like all their Afghan employees were hounding them for support to apply for SIVs. Uh, and that at the time there even had developed a black market for fake Taliban threat letters yeah. um, because people needed to demonstrate some degree of threat to, to apply for an SIV and that literally you could spend $250 and someone would give you a fake letter that said the Taliban were threatening you. Um, so that was kind of the, the level of desperation at that point. Once the security agreement was signed and it was clear that the U.S. and NATO mission was going to continue after 2014, it, it calmed down a little bit. Um, but ultimately, you know, the security never really got to a place where people were confident um, that that it was going to turn in in the right direction and there was always sort of ongoing uncertainty that even though there was an agreement how how long will the international community stay and you know there were a lot of people arguing well look the key is just just stay um because you know that's kind of fingers in the dike type of thing um but i think you know People always felt that that classic expression that, you know, the West had the watches, but the Taliban had the time and it was always a waiting game. And at some point, you know, the, the international money and will was going to drop to a level uh, that it was going to tip in their favor. So, you know, I never got a sense that there was, you know, tremendous confidence from from that period onward that, um, you know, there was going to be sort of a, a, a great you know, happy ending there. And to me, you know, the way I always sort of talked about is I, I, I did feel a pretty strong sense of pessimism from the time I got there and everything that I saw. And to me, it was a question of, you know, how hard the landing was going to be, you know, what's the glide path to some level that is sustainable in the Afghan context of, the human capital, the, you know, the values, all of those things that it turns into an Afghan, you know, sort of Afghan owned Afghanistan, as opposed to this international construct that kept being propped up um, that, you know, a, a lot of Afghans, again, they were happy to take the money, but they didn't necessarily buy into, you know, all of these things. Um, I mean, to the point that I, I interviewed, Sometime, I think in 2013, the chief like religious advisor to President Karzai and this guy held a bunch of positions. But in our conversation, and we were talking specifically around the effort to pass the elimination of violence against women law in Afghanistan. That was a presidential decree that parliament hadn't passed. Uh, this guy, you know, who was the advisor to President Karzai in religious affairs says, you know, a woman <clears throat> on television delivering the news is violence against women. A woman performing music is violence against women. I mean, this guy was, you know, Taliban by another name, basically, in terms of his views. Mm -hmm. And that was another moment where I said, OK, there's this you know, Western narrative of this educated, progressive community in Kabul, that's the future of Afghanistan. And for every example people could tout of that, there were guys like this who were extremely powerful and influential, who believed women should be covered at home and, uh, you know, not in parliament, not doing all these other things. And uh, so that I, I just felt that the undercurrents were, you know, were very strong. And just one other quick anecdote related to that, I did, you know, some other reporting before I'd left about, uh, you know, women's rights. And, and at that point, the U.S. was investing in another enormous program to do women's empowerment. 
And I talked to some of the Afghan women's rights leaders, and even some of them were saying, you know, this is this is not the right approach. Um, because, number one, a lot of the women who are getting into these programs are already empowered because they're in elite circles, which is how they kind of are able to even get into these programs. But secondly, it's not dealing with a problem. The problem is not the women, it's the men. That, you know, if you have a woman who goes to one of these programs and goes home to a household where her husband or her father believes women are property that should be locked up, you're in some ways making things worse because you're raising expectations. And they said, you know, the investment needs to be on changing the men. And as long as you're not making progress on that, these other things, again, it's that second floor of the house. Uh, and so just, you know, across the board, I was seeing things that, that looked good, that sounded good, that were helping some people, um, but the underlying dynamics were were still in in a very different place, um, and and you know weren't going to suddenly change overnight. Oh, absolutely, and it's it's something we see. I feel like now with the Taliban's anti woman laws, and we don't see Afghan man, men standing up and saying no. <clears throat> I think mm -hmm. a lot of that is because, and I've seen it. You know, there are a lot of campaigns like, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. the Stand with Women in Afghanistan campaign campaign and. I remember posting about that and then having men show up on my thing and they're not talibs, but they're saying, Hey, no, the women are safe now because they're home. Yeah. That's how they're safe. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. You yeah. sir are part of the problem. Like I talk to women every day who are in that situation right now. And they're still not every day, every week <laughs> uh, who are devastated. And, and I don't know, you know, in some cases the men in their lives are helping to keep them that way out of mm -hmm. safety but sometimes it's their real belief. Um, I would share some stories, but I would be throwing some men I care about <laughs> very deeply under the bus. And that's the thing yeah. is how do you tell someone, Hey, what you're doing to your wife? I'm, I'm not really thrilled with that, that thing that you just shared with me. Let's not be doing that. And it's nothing, obviously, you know, I'm not talking about beatings or anything of that nature, but just right. these subtle, um, things that you're, you think, okay, let's, this is something we really need to fix. It's something I'm, I imagine that was difficult to watch and know that that too is something that we're just trying to paper over it. And look, look at all these great programs we have, the USAID programs, yeah. you know, a woman who graduated from several of them and became a hairdresser and was able to have a um, separation from her husband who had been beating her since she was married to him at the age of 13. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the government collapsed and what now? Now yeah. she can't go to a domestic violence shelter. She can't work. She, her husband is threatening her because they're not technically divorced. They didn't get, right. I don't think the divorces were ever really decreed. It was this kind of quasi divorce situation. So yeah, we, we really did, I think, create harm in the effort to do good things for women. It's, it's really devastating to see that now. Um, yeah, I mean that that was one of the the biggest tensions. Um, I I felt one of the biggest frustrations, just in general, and and things you know I've written about since. My my concern when I saw things on the ground was the international community was making a lot of promises to the people of Afghanistan that were incredibly unrealistic um, and should not have been made, and unfortunately they were made. And now you know there is an obligation to try to still make good, at least, you know, the issue with the SIVs is okay. There was a promise that if you worked for the U S government and fulfilled these, these conditions, you would get a visa. So that of anything, that promise needs to be honored. Um, but some of the things in terms of, yes, you know, women are going to be equal and all this. It, I, I, I always felt really, you know, just kind of icky in a way. Uh, when I was there, because I'm like, you know, pe women are and, you know, young Afghans who are buying into a lot of these programs, hoping for a future that I, I, I just saw very low odds that that it was going to going to work out that way and that they were still facing a lot of internal opposition. And, you know, one story I I didn't get to finish before I left just because the 2014 election sucked up so much time and energy. Uh, because, you know, it was contested and drawn out for months and months. But 
I was I, I did a bunch of stories that were trying to counter some of the big narratives. So the education story about how, you know, 10 million Afghans in school, 40 percent women. Well, I did a long story really deconstructing that and showing that those numbers weren't accurate and the level of education being delivered was, you know, orders of magnitude less than what was being sold. And one of the other narratives I wanted to push back on was this young, educated generation of progressive Afghans who are going to usher in this, this new future. And I talked to and interviewed some people who are part of is, uh, Islamist youth movements in Afghanistan. And so there were some educated, English-speaking, ultra-conservative Afghan youth movements that were going on at the same time that the West was trying to promote these, you know, young progressive Afghans. And uh, again, I, 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 you know, regret that I wasn't able to finish that story because I felt that was an important thing to put on the table and say, hey, wait a second. You know, yes, there are, this is true. There are a lot of young Afghans. A lot of them are people who came back from other places where they had grown up and had passports to other places. So they had a way out if things didn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, not to diminish, you know, some of the, the sacrifices some of these people made on behalf of their country. I mean, they did go back, they did work, but a lot of them did have an out. Yet there were large numbers of young Afghans who were educated, who wanted a very conservative, traditional society going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so the youth narrative was way more complicated than you know, the messaging coming out of, out of Kabul and other international capitals. Interesting. I never knew about that. I wish you had finished that. I'm, <laughs> now my next thing I'm going to do when I find some free hours is look at this reporting. Cause really I stopped looking in Afghanistan in 2013, the moment mm -hmm. the Taliban raised that flag over their negotiations office, because I was yeah. going to lose my mind if I kept looking at it uh, and I wasn't, you know, in the intelligence community anymore, there was nothing I could do about it. I was a rural stay at home wife slash writer slash mother to be, you yeah. know? And so it was like, I can't do this, but you were in that. And I, I would love to be able to read all, I'm going to look up all <laughs> these things that you were writing about at the time because they are vital and important. And that's, you know, the work of every journalist. I always, joke that, you know, the State Department is just going to stop answering my questions because they're going to get so mad at me for <laughs> constantly pushing against everything that they're doing. But that's the job. That is yeah. the job. It's saying, okay, I hear what you're saying, but here are the facts. And those are really important facts because, and then that's, you know, that's what I did in my intelligence career. You're saying this, but hold on, I'm seeing something very different. Right. Like, let's, right. like, you got to speak truth to power for a lack of something else that would come to my mind right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. And which was exactly what my later job was at the, the inspector general's office. Yes. And uh, I yeah. want to hear about yeah. that. That's, that's something I really want to hear about because I've been enamored of every inspector general working on this effort and just finding the facts and details. So when did you get involved with that and what were those years like? Yeah, so that was in 2017. Uh, so, uh, you know, a little while after I, I got back uh, from Afghanistan. And just just so I think probably most of your audience knows this, but there's still often some confusion because there's there's SIGAR, which is the Special Inspector General, which was stood up, I think, in 2008 as a standalone office to do oversight of Afghanistan reconstruction. And then in 2013, 14, Congress created the lead inspector general, which was a essentially a, a construct of the Defense Department, state and USAID offices of inspector general would work together to do quarterly reporting on overseas contingency operations. So our mandate was larger than than just cigar because we had um Iraq, Syria, the, the you know counter ISIS operation there. We did reporting on uh, counterterrorism operations in the Philippines and Africa, as well as the the Afghanistan report. So, I came in to the DoD Inspector General's office as the lead writer of the uh, quarterly report on uh, Operation Freedom Sentinel in August of 2017, which was right when the Trump administration dropped its South Asia strategy. 
and that was sort of the last gasp uh, because when President Trump came in, he wanted out of Afghanistan right away. And, you know, uh, Secretary Mattis and others were able to negotiate, look, give us a little more time. Let's try one more kind of effort. So the South Asia strategy was that effort. It was a little bit of a, a, a minor plus up of some troops back into Afghanistan and some repackaging of a lot of the previous efforts. But it was it, it was largely a rebranding of you know, various efforts that, that had gone on. And it was a small increase in troops. It was, it was not a revolutionary change to things. Uh, and so when I came in, that strategy was being implemented. Uh, General Nicholson was the commander in Afghanistan at the time. And he was saying some things that set off alarm bells for me, because he was talking about, you know, we're going to get to a point where 80% of the population is in areas under government control or influence. And that's going to be a tipping point at which the Taliban is going to be forced to, you know, negotiate a settlement and all this. And they're talking about all, the, all these, these things were happening. I said, wait a second, I've heard this 80% thing before. And so I went back and while I was there, when General Dunford was the commander, at one point he said, 80% of the population in Afghanistan is living in areas under government control and influence. And I said, well, wait a second, if, if that 80% number had been hit in 2013 and peace didn't break out, what's going to be different this time? What are you doing differently with fewer troops and fewer resources that's going to get back to this 80% number from what was significantly below that. Uh, and how is it going to be different? And so in our oversight reporting, we were aggressively questioning DOD about this and the South Asia strategy and how it was going to be different. How did they come up with this 80% number, all these different things? Um, they provided information back in one of the reports. I wrote this analysis deconstructing their argument, supporting how this 80% number was going to be magical. And, and, uh, after that, they, you know, the talking points kind of went away and they, they backed away from talking about some of these things and they stopped using some of the metrics they had been using to demonstrate progress and, and security and things like that. Um, and so, you know, that was a case where because of my time on the ground, when I was in this, you know, this government oversight position and hearing these things, I'm like, wait a second, this, you know, this stuff doesn't add up. And so, you know, we had the, the platform of those quarterly reports to, to push back on it. Um, it, you know, it, it, it was, it was journalism of a different sort because we had rules about how we could get information, how we could interact with the government. And, and so, you know, you couldn't do the journalism thing of meet someone in a quiet place and talk to them on background and use their stuff anonymously. You know, everything had to be official and sourced from the department and other sources. Um, but I think, you know, the reporting still um, maintained pressure and accountability and kept saying, show us your metrics, show us the progress, show us how you are demonstrating that this investment, whether it's a military investment, a State Department investment, or a USAID investment, is translating to progress. And the answers were often, you know, I always talk about the difference between outputs and outcomes, right? They could say, we spent $200 million on this program, the money was spent, and 75,000 people engaged in the program. Those are outputs. So, okay, what's the outcome? Did it change? Did it lead to demonstrable progress, better security, better capacity? Well, that's too hard to measure. So we measure, you know, the outputs. And I think that was always one of the frustrations with Afghanistan was the things you could measure were what people talked about. Yes, the X number of people went to school. Okay, that's fine. But did they get any education while they were in school? was it leading to something? And those were the questions that in my time in the inspector general's office, there were rarely satisfying answers to that. 
And that was just kind of another sign that when the answers are, well, it's too hard to measure the outcomes. So, well, but the outcome is what you're trying to get to. This operation isn't about spending money and numbers of people that participate in programs. It's about building a stable country um, where people are safe, secure, and have a better future. And if you can't show that what you're doing is leading up to that, how can you go before Congress and the American people and keep saying, give us, give us more money for this? Sure. Yeah. I, so when about, it sounds a lot like um, talking to Bill Raggio about when they stopped sharing, I think mm. maps showing, you know, it sounds like that's kind of an overlap here that you guys discussed or, or that he discussed with us a couple months ago, yep. you know, where those metrics stopped being, provided because they weren't matching up to things that say like Bill Raggio was putting out at FDD and uh, whereabouts were, so you were there through 21, correct? Yeah. So I, I left in, in March of 21. So at that point, the Doha agreement had been signed. Uh, and in that last you know year that I was there, when that agreement was in place, a lot of our questioning was, okay, you know, how are you going to implement this? What's your plan? How are you going to transition all of these contractor maintenance programs and things like that? Um, and it was interesting to me in that period is we were asking a lot of questions and my sense was, and I mean, what I can basically say um, is that people within the Pentagon did not believe the U S was going to withdraw completely. Wow. I, there were people who believed that there would be a side agreement negotiated to the Doha deal that would at least allow contracted maintenance to stay in place for the ANDSF. Um, if not some deal that was going to allow some number of troops to stay. Um, I, uh, uh, really, it was just shocking that how many people just didn't believe the U.S. was going to pull everything out, even though the agreement basically said that they felt that either the conditionality in the agreement would allow for a prolonged presence or there'd be some other deal. Um, and because the belief was that the solution for Afghanistan at that point wasn't a win, it was a just don't lose, just don't leave. As long as the U.S. doesn't leave, you know, the worst case stuff won't happen, which I mean was true, but it was still kind of prolonging the inevitable um, because at that level of support and presence, the Taliban was only going to continue to, to chip away and it wasn't forcing, obviously, a negotiated political deal. So. Um, that was that was a weird time sort of in that last year that I was there watching things kind of unfold and, and people, uh, you know, again, kind of in, in disbelief that it was going to end and saying, well, no, you just you can't you can't let it end. So, OK, well, what what's your what's your plan other than just don't leave, which seemed to be the, the last plan. Right. And the, I mean it kind of goes back full circle to what we talked about in the beginning with, uh, you know, the PRTs being supposed to work for the Afghan government, right? It's supposed to be some extension of the Afghan government, but it was us mm -hmm. and it's the Taliban's whole, well, that's a puppet government. And, and that's right. exactly what we showed them in the end. We negotiated Doha with the Taliban. We did not involve the Afghan government that was supposed to happen down the line and it never did. So who was going to ask us to stay? The Taliban were certainly not going to ask us to stay and prop up their people that they had continued to kill, mm -hmm. even when they weren't killing us. It's just, I don't know, maybe my facts might not, if my facts are incorrect, please, please uh, feel free to correct them. But that whole juxtaposition of things, I, I can't imagine how people would really think we could stay in that scenario, you know, that uh, I, I, I agree that we sh should have and that we should have found a way to continue being there and, and making mm -hmm. it less, um, less of a huge change in such a short period. And, and you guys were asking all the right questions. It sounds like, what are you going to do with the contractors without whom the Afghan air force cannot operate? Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, all of these very important questions that 
you know, were you getting good answers or was this something that they were flying by the seat of their pants? Just kind of like, Oh, we'll do. Cause that's how it feels from an outside it, perspective. It was more of the latter than, than you would have hoped. Um, I mean, you know, there were people who were basically saying, it's like, look, I'm, you know, contractors are going to have to come out. And if they do, that means, you know, Afghan air force will only be able to, to fly X long before, you know, they, they can't maintain their stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, there was a lot of concern and that's why a lot of people, I think in the Pentagon really believe that there was going to be some solution or some alternative or some side deal or carve out to the Doha agreement. Um, because yeah, the feeling was that if all support is pulled out, it's only a matter of time before Afghan security forces, collapse. Now, you know, obviously there were two dimensions that one was just their maintaining their equipment. Um, but there was the, the will on their part. And that was the thing that really, I think shocked a lot of people, uh, was how quickly Afghan security forces as the U S was withdrawing and the Taliban was making gains in that, you know, summer 21 period, uh, the Afghan forces were like, you know, I'm, uh, it's, it's not worth my, my life at this point. And I don't feel I I'm fighting for a government that has my back. You know, president Ghani was, was not inspiring confidence and, you know, people made some, some difficult decisions um, at, at that point. And certainly, you know, that's, we saw that both in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, that the international troop presence creates that pressure on, you know, the local forces to continue showing up and, you know, ISIS took over in Iraq after, you know, the U S military campaign ended and U S forces left. Uh, and there was a similar thing that Iraqi forces kind of wilted in the face of, of the ISIS movement. Uh, and a similar thing happened in, in Afghanistan. I think a lot of people legitimately knew that was going to happen and were pushing for, something other than complete withdrawal. And, um, you know, I, th I think what happened was certainly going to happen with the execution of the Doha agreement. It just ended up happening a lot faster than, than a lot of people even thought in their, their worst case scenarios. Sure. Yeah. It was a very <clears throat> unsteady time. What was it like for you? So you were out of your DOD mm -hmm. IG job at that point. And, and what were you up to in the withdrawal period? Yeah, so I, I was uh, I was writing my book at that point. So I, I left uh, DOD, uh, the IG office in, in March of 21 to go, you know, write my book about my experiences and kind of processing my time, you know, not just in Afghanistan, but the years leading up to that, running around Iraq and the Congo and, Yemen and other places. So I was in, in the midst of writing that watching, you know, kind of from a distance, uh, this whole thing unfold. And, uh, yeah, I mean, look, you know, incredible sense of, of frustration is, you know, as I, I did write about a sense of, you know, looking back, like a lot of people, like, did I do enough when I was there to, communicate to report to the international community how flawed the entire enterprise was uh and to provide more warning that's like look this th these approaches aren't working um that the the gravity here is pulling in the taliban's direction over time and the international community really needs to figure out an approach that isn't contingent on building this self-sustaining Afghan military that is going to keep the Taliban at bay and then building an inclusive Afghan government that's going to agree on an approach to negotiations with the Taliban. That stuff just wasn't coming together and it was going to take generations to achieve those things. Uh, so yeah, there, I, I felt some sense that I didn't do enough to get that message out and to you know, push for more accountability of, of leadership. And instead there was the echo chamber in DC and officials would go before Congress and say, 
just give us more time, just give us more money. We can, you know, we can do this. And despite all the oversight reporting from Cigar, from Lead IG, from others indicating things weren't delivering, um, the, people just kept either doubling down or trying repackaging of, of the same approaches. So it was incredibly frustrating. And then, yeah, I mean, there was sort of the, you know, the, the moral injury aspect of thinking of, you know, friends and colleagues and people I knew who gave their lives in the effort uh, and thinking about all the forces who uh, fought and, and died or came home with life altering injuries in the campaign and, and how that was going to affect them and how were people going to process this and deal with this question of what, you know, what was it all for? How do we put our collective service? And I, I do, you know, as I write about in the book, really try to emphasize the importance of the civilians who serve there because there's so much discussion about the military and the impact on veterans and PTSD and suicides and things where there's, you know, unmet needs there. But thousands and thousands of civilians work there from journalists to diplomats to aid workers, contractors who experienced all sorts of, of traumas. Um, and there isn't an adv advocacy organization. There isn't a VA for the civilians. Um, and there are a lot of people running around uh, who are are dealing with trauma, with PTSD, um, you know, life altering impacts of working in these places. And certainly the way it ended, uh, is not at all helpful for, for people. Um, but that's, you know, a, a big part of where I was literally at that time writing about my experiences and my own mental health impacts of doing that work and how that changed me and how I'm continuing to understand and process that. Um, and that was an incredibly traumatic moment for everyone who had spent time in that country. And I think, you know, a lot of people still looking for some kind of closure for some type of understanding to be able to put that in, in some place that they can, you know, they can reckon with. Yeah. I'm, Speaking to your civilians point, we've had a lot of people on the podcast who maybe they taught English to Afghan Air Force personnel, Joan Barker, or were contractors teaching English and you know mm -hmm. veterans, but became contractors um, or uh, gosh, Lark Escobar. And so many of those people, Lark Escobar also taught, um, but you know, these great civilian people and now they're involved in the post withdrawal effort mm -hmm. because it just left such a that time scar, right? The we a lot of people come on and talk about moral injury and mm -hmm. you know, they differentiate yep. that from PTSD, you know, as something that yeah, you're forced to do something that goes against your moral code. And you can just see them trying to repair that because they're still two and a half years on doing this work to support Afghans who are stuck, who, yeah. you know, have been promised SIVs or promised um P one or P two status in the US refugee admissions program or or who have applied for humanitarian parole and absolutely deserve it for the threat that they face and, you know, are just in limbo, terrified. And so it's like that it continued for so many people, especially because the, you know, just the nature of those efforts, right? You're up at ungodly hours to help Afghans in their time zone and then trying to do your own life in the hours yeah. that you have. It's just, there's been a lot that's been lumped on all these people who were impacted and, and even if they weren't involved in that, it is a lot to process. I remember watching the TV and I'm not somebody who watches a lot of TV or watches the news. I mean, I might write the news, mm -hmm. but I don't really watch it. And during those weeks of the withdrawal, that's all I had on was to yeah. see what is happening right now. And I, I would wake up at all hours to get updates. What's happening now? Are we letting, you know, how many, all these big questions. And like you said, did I do enough? Could I have done more? It's definitely really a very difficult thing. How did you get, was it harder? Do you think being at the place where you were? Because obviously you're already trying to parse through all these things mm -hmm. and this giant event happens in the midst of it. Did it help you or was it a hindrance? Do you think? Uh, I don't know. I mean, on, on one level it, it was, you know, sort of an 
unfortunate confirmation of what I had, you know, believed and kind of predicted for years. And it's one of those things that you don't want to be right about. Um, what was frustrating was knowing the likely outcome, um, how, how poorly everyone managed the, the transition and the landing. Um, as I said, you know, I always knew it was, it was going to, the baseline was going to be well below what anyone wanted. And it was a question of how, you know, how fast and how hard the landing came. And, um, you know, it, it, it was shocking. Um, you know, it was really frustrating. It was painful, but I said it, on another level, it wasn't surprising. Um, it was disappointing because I did feel that in the last, you know, year to 18 months in the run up to it, I don't think that the U S government did nearly enough to manage it. Um, you know, I don't know if you caught it. There was a hearing yesterday about this with uh, General Milley and McKenzie talking about the, you know, the withdrawal and, and how things played out. And, uh, you know, everyone has, has, owns a piece of the, you know, the, the blame. Um, but it was interesting how much they were pointing the finger at the State Department, um, at least on the whole NEO aspect. And, uh, you know, they were arguing that the Defense Department had plans in place for withdrawal and things like that. You know, my sense, as we talked about earlier, I don't know that how robust the planning was because I still felt like a lot of people in the Pentagon didn't believe that that it was really going to happen. Um, but it is, you know, State Department, um, you know, did did not manage things at all well. Uh, and as everyone said, there should have been more planning for an exit and they should have sounded the alarm earlier than they did that things were not going to go well and that the U.S. diplomatic presence was going to have to get out. Uh, and then again, the planning for, for the Afghans. Um, so uh, that, you know, that part is incredibly frustrating that, um, you know, people who should have known better uh, either weren't speaking loudly or, or weren't getting, you know, the, the buy-in and the plans in place to, to, to deal with things. Uh, you know, again, the SIV thing has been incredibly frustrating. I did reporting on that starting back in like 2011 in Iraq. I did stories in Iraq and Afghanistan about so many cases. And, you, you know, you've, you've heard them all, you know, this as well as anyone uh, how incredibly frustrating that program has been and how long people have been aware of that and still haven't solved a lot of problems. It's still incredibly non-transparent um, and there aren't enough slots and there aren't enough resources. So, you know, that's frustrating. I mean, even just literally just yesterday, I had a call with the lawyer for the Afghan who was the cook at the NPR bureau. Um, and, you know, NPR's lawyers have been working with the, the staff and, and, um, he, he's going through an asylum process. He and his family came into to the U S and, and so they're working on that. Uh, I, you know, a year within the last year did a, an affidavit supporting my former driver. Um, so, you know, still ongoing efforts, even getting some of the, the Afghans who worked for NPR out and settled and in a you know, permanent legal place in the U S. So, um, even though again, so I'm not with NPR, so I'm only, you know, providing additional supporting documentation. So yes, this person worked for me. Here's, you know, character reference, things like that. I'm not in the day to day, but, um, you know, it's, it's just brutal how many people are still going through this and how many people I know are, as you said, you know, work burning the, the midnight oil, trying to, to help the people that, that they knew and, and worked with and who, um, you know, fulfilled their service and, and are owed the make good on the promises made to them. Yeah. It's, I was just, you know, the times obviously are so weird because I just filmed an episode last night about those SIVs, which will be, by the time that this comes out, it'll have been a couple weeks. Um, mm -hmm from that. But for people who want to go back, you know, Andy Sullivan from No One Left Behind and Sean Van Diver from Afghan Evac were talking about, you know, the things that still have to be done. And I just mentioned that, you know, I've been out here pounding the pavement, getting people to call and say, hey, we need the SIV program, like call your yeah. rep, tell them, put these numbers in. 
And every example I was coming up with was, here's one time the SIV program screwed up. Here's another. Mm -hmm. And my point being, though, it is a screwed up program. Absolutely. Lack of transparency. You know, you're denied, but we're not going to tell you why, even though we are legally required to tell you why so that you can appeal your denial, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. But a flawed program is better than a non-existent program because you can continue to appeal a flawed program. Right. You can't do one that's run out of SIVs. And so it's just everything I feel like that goes along with this entire effort is just plagued with um, Western thinking and, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, not helpful for Afghans. And that's why I hope I, you know, the last thing I would want to ask you is what is your hope for the future of Afghanistan? Because obviously the Taliban can't stay forever. At least that's my hope is that yeah. that's obvious, you know, maybe it's not so obvious. Um, and maybe, uh, I don't really know, but what, what do you see happening in Afghanistan in the future? Or what do you think yeah, let's just leave it at that. Yeah. I mean, look, one of the things that and I, you know, I've kind of mentioned throughout the conversation is, you know, the Taliban is not some completely alien entity. I mean, it emerged out of Afghan society. I mean, yes, there were other influences of, of Pakistan and some, you know, religious movements that weren't entirely indigenous to, to Afghanistan, but still a lot of the values that, you know, the Taliban promotes are, are beliefs from a significant percentage of the Afghan population. So I said, you know, talked about the, the, the Karzai religious advisor and a lot of people I met in rural Afghanistan who said, you know, I hate the Taliban because of their brutality, but I, kind of agree with a lot of their, you know, moral philosophy and, and practice in general. So, you know, I think people need, need to recognize that it isn't just this alien entity sitting on top of a country yearning to be, you know, free and progressive and democratic. Um, there is internal support of some degree for, for the Taliban. So that that's the one thing to to recognize is that there are people in Afghanistan who do support the the moral code of of the Taliban and the religious approach. Um, I don't think there's any short term likelihood of of any significant change. You know, the Taliban has shown it is able to withstand the international pressure. Uh, in terms of dangling recognition, of dangling more money, things like that, you know, they've now, you know, two and a half years, they have they have withstood that without making any concessions on women's rights or democracy or minority rights or things like that. So I think people have to recognize the the difficulty of the situation and that there aren't easy carrots or sticks to get them to change anytime soon. Um, is there a point where things don't get better for the average person just in terms of their ability to feed themselves and have a life that there is internal discord that reaches a level that forces the Taliban? You know, maybe. I think that's sort of the best thing that can be hoped for in, in the near term is that internal frustration grows to a level where the people feel that something has to happen because anything that's purely external, I think Afghanistan has shown for, for centuries that it, it, it shakes off international intervention. Uh, so, you know, I think people have to be targeted, be realistic, um, be incremental and recognize that the focus now has to be on minimizing suffering in Afghanistan. Because if you go into it thinking the, the goal now is, you know, equality for women and minorities and, and these promises that were made, that's not going to get anywhere. But thinking about how, how can the international community work around the Taliban as much as possible and with them in the most sort of harmless ways to help the Afghan people, um, that's, that's where the energy needs to be focused. Um, because again, 
if the thought is overthrow of radical change, anything like that, I, I, I just don't think any of those approaches are, are going to get anywhere. And it's, it's brutal. And again, it's, it's just horrible to think of all these people who are living there now who for 20 years were told what, what their lives were going to be and they were empowered and they were given opportunities that have been now taken away. Uh, it, I mean, it, as tragic as it is, trying to find a way to suddenly deliver that promise uh, is, is unrealistic. So again, deal with the, the human suffering, minimize that for now and think longer term is, is, you know, to me, the most rational approach. Yeah. Uh, your argument makes great sense. I still would love to see something drastic and fast happen. Sure. You're right. It has to be sustainable. And it's something that I keep seeing with you know, Afghans who fled, who used to be in the government, there's so much, you know, well, I want to be the main guy going forward. I want to be the end. Mm -hmm. And there has to be consensus. If you don't have consensus among a group that could come back in and be the government again, which was so much of the problem before, you know, absolutely. Well, you're not from here. You're not from there, you know, guys. Yeah. We've got to, there's got to be unity here or you'll never be able to pose any kind of, you know, not central, you know, Afghanistan is so unique. It has to be an yeah. Afghan solution. And that's the thing that I always come back to is here I am this Westerner. Right. I, I can't come up with a solution. Right. I think you're probably right. Minimize suffering, do good where possible, but don't prop them up. Don't, you know, that's the part that always gets me is never, never recognize that what they're doing is okay. Yeah, no, I, that, that, absolutely. <laughs> and and I think though, to, to the point you just raised, I think it is important. And I, I, I've written about it in the past is making sure that, you know, look, the, the West, the international community um, has a lot of responsibility for how things played out, but you know, that Afghans do as well. And I think that's been sometimes missing from the conversation is Afghan power brokers for 20 years failed to come together and present a unified position, work together as an integrated country and pre present that face to the Taliban at the table and say, hey, we're, you know, here's where we are. Here's a political structure we can all work with. And, you know, they all continued to, to fight each other. You know, the 2014 election was an example of, of how split people were and power brokers with their militias and everyone wanting to be the person and not wanting to, to come together with this group or that group. Um, and so, you know, the, the Afghan power brokers also deserve, you know, a lot of blame and criticism for how they handled things uh, and missed opportunities to embrace it and make things more of that, that Afghan solution that you were talking about. It's such a, it just, you know, this whole conversation reminds me of how incredibly complicated this problem set is and why I was drawn to it in 2008, <laughs> because it just seemed you say, and it's another point from that Hill opinion piece that I just read it and I, I highlighted it because it spoke to me so clearly. You talk about how I felt that America's presence there was doomed from my first moments in Afghanistan. And that's kind of how I was like, wow, look at this tangle, this spaghetti. Have you, I'm sure you've seen the counterinsurgency spaghetti. Mm -hmm. um, the first podcast I ever did, my, my really good friends have a podcast. And when Afghanistan uh, fell to the Taliban, um, they had me come on and talk about why it was happening. And I brought that up, the, the giant coin map, and I'll link to it in the show notes, but just all the things that play together that had to come yeah. together and work well for Afghanistan to, to succeed. And when you look at that, it's just such a clear indication of uh, that's almost impossible. All of those things, you know, working together in, in any setting multipliers. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like it is a very, very complex country. There is a lot of trauma. You talk about the trauma that we've come forward with, mm -hmm. and especially you. I mean, for me, I never went into the country. I never, you know, you were so intimately involved in so many difficult things, losing friends, you know, witnessing the, the aftermath of bombings, which cannot be easy to experience. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the trauma that's here. These are people who've been in trauma for decades. You know, it's a trauma response yeah. to go, okay, yeah, I'll work for you. And yes, I'll plant your bomb. Cause I don't want my head to be chopped off in front of my children. You know, like yeah. those, those are also trauma responses that have, oh, I'm, that's a country where there's just so much pain. 
I have such a heart for Afghan people and just the, the difficulties that they've been through, but also it's like, we've got to help them to get those tools, right. To overcome that trauma, to have this society that can flourish where women can, I don't know. That's what I want for them. But when is it, well, I come back full circle to, <laughs> I'm just a Westerner and that's what I want, but it has to be what Afghans want. They have to, there's so much I can't do. So Sean, I yep. really appreciate you coming on and, and giving me all these things to think about. Uh, it's going to be a great day inside my head. Um, well, I, I, I guess uh, you're, you're welcome. And I apologize at the same time for all of those years, you know, from just covering things in 2009 and being the NPR correspondent, like you did what I wanted to do. And I'm just really, it's an honor to have you here. So thank you for talking with me and sharing your story. My pleasure, Beth. It was great, great to speak with you. Um, just for our Afghan listeners, I want to put out the call. Uh, per usual, we always like to end episodes with a story from an Afghan listener about what they've been through during the wartime years, the post-withdrawal years, um, any period. You can send those stories in to the Afghanistan Project podcast at gmail.com, and we would be like honored to share them. And I just want to thank all of our listeners for taking your time, supporting the people of Afghanistan. And if you've enjoyed the episode, make sure to go to the YouTube page and enable notifications so you can get uh, an update every time we drop something in the future. But for now, Tasha Kaur, and hope to see you again soon.